Welcome back to the Self-Esteem and Confidence Mindset podcast with me, Johnny Pardo, here to help you take control of your self-confidence. Today, I have a very special guest. So welcome, Vidu. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great for you to be here. And I'm really, really looking forward to our conversation today and the immense value um, conversation we're going to have. So thanks once again. So I'll give a quick introduction to Vinu today, and then she can give a little bit more about her and we'll go into the conversation. So Vinu is a family parent child coach, an author, a neuroencoding specialist, a brain trainer, and a Tony Robbins trainer, and many, many more things, but I'll let her go into the story in a little bit more. Uh, great, great woman with such, such value. So she focuses on creating an environment where kids are communicated to Effectively, they can be safe, seen, and heard. Vinu also has had lots of challenges in her life where she's struggled with issues such as self-worth and self-doubt. And she's made a huge transformation for her life that's taken to her to so many levels and met so many people and made a huge impact on people and done many of the things I've mentioned previously. So really looking forward to uh, what you've got to say today, Vinu. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about your story and what got you into this area? Sure. So, um, you know, I think most people have self-esteem, self, self image issues growing up. I think it all stems a lot from when we were children and the background we've grown up with, like the environment we've grown up, grown up in. And you know, for me, I was, it was, it was no different for me. You know, um, I was, um, the first generation born in the United States. My parents had an arranged marriage in India and then came to California where my dad was already settled and had my brother and I, and then they divorced when we were little, which in our culture was just not a known thing. And so my mom raised us kids by herself, put herself through law school and, you know, I remember, you know, at, at as early as the age of six, feeling like I'm different, like people would make fun of my skin color, you know, um, people like, oh, don't touch me. I don't want to be black like you. And it's like, you don't realize at six years old that, you know, our skin colors are different. Like you just, you're just a kid. You're just a kid having fun on the playground until somebody makes that distinction that, hey, you are different. And so, you know, I grew up feeling different from everybody. I grew up feeling isolated. Um, I remember telling my mom stories about, you know, the way the kids, you know, say things to me and she would just blow it off. Like, well, kids will be kids. And, you know, was it because that's what she really felt? Was that because she didn't have the answers? I don't know. All I know is that's what she told me. And, you know, it's in those moments that our parents tell us things that we start to realize, like, is there anybody there to hear me? Does anybody care about me? who sees me, who hears me. And, you know, I don't even think at that young age, we're, we're thinking about it in that depth of what's really happening. And yet our behaviors continue to thrive in a way that we continue to feel not seen and heard. And we start to feel depressed or anxious. And I see it more and more all the time now. And so like, that's why one of my my key things is teaching parents, like, how do you give a kid a childhood that they don't have to heal from as an adult? Because I feel like that's what we do. We're on these trajectories of how do we heal? Like when you have like, you know, alcohol therapists or drug therapists, like most of them have been an alcoholic or an addict and they've recovered, if you would say. And so now they're helping other people to heal from it. You know, we're always looking for that release. And for me as a child, like I self-harmed, I used to cut. And then, you know, I spent 34 years, uh, 20, I'm sorry, 21 years of my life feeling suicidal and always having that exit plan because I just didn't want to live anymore. And, you know, and then something would happen and I was like, oh, no, I have to live. Like I got married at a young age and I had children, you know, at the age of 20. And so now I had to live because I had to be there for them. And there was always a had to, not a get to. And so, you know, going through my whole life of looking at where I was and to where I am now, it's really been, really, it started when I learned that I didn't need an exit plan to change my life. I just needed to choose 
a different life and what I wanted and what that looked like and have clarity and awareness of what I want and how I need to get it. And that's when everything started to pivot for me. Hmm. And what, and when was the, was there a particular moment when you, you kind of decided that or made that change in your head? So I, you know, everything I feel happens for a reason. Sometimes we don't even know what the reason is. Um, and I happened to be on a little quick vacation with a friend. I went down to Florida. Um, I'm in North Carolina mm -hmm. and, um, in the United States. And I met a, a girl who was volunteer crewing for Tony Robbins and her and her mom were talking about Tony and walking on fire and getting ready to go to Australia to do this date with destiny. And in my mind, I'm thinking like, I would never walk on fire. Like, I don't want to burn my feet. Like, why would somebody want to walk on fire? Like, why? These people are stupid. Like, what is wrong with these people? And the next thing you know, a week later, I'm walking on fire at a UPW. And it was when I left that particular seminar, I knew that I was going to live. And that was probably the toughest decision that I ever had to make because I had no plan. Like, I've always been a planner. Like, I you know, I, I, I planned out everything. I even planned out that the year I was going to kill myself was 2016. Like everything was a plan to me. And now all of a sudden I had no plan, but I knew I was going to live like suicide was off the table. And although I was not sure of what that looked like, I just knew that that was no longer an option. And, you know, coming back after a four day seminar where you're in an environment where everyone's shouting and yelling and changing their life and crying and hugging it out and high-fiving to isolation again, you know, weeks later, it was changing that mindset like, okay, but I know I can do this, but I know I can do this and I'm going to do this. Each day I got up saying, okay, I'm going to do this and started to realize that it started with self-love. And it started with self-esteem and that self-worth and understanding what those words meant. And what I realized was self-esteem was how I viewed myself and my self-worth was how I felt about myself, the worth that I had in this world, the worth that I had to myself and other people. And, you know, a lot of people can say, well, that that's it. That's the ticket. Just, to, just know your worth, like know you're good enough. Well, that's all great. But if you don't know what that looks like or feels like, how do you do that? How do you accomplish that? And what I realized was that it was almost like, I tell people like, if I said, you know, close your eyes and imagine holding a red rose. If you don't know what a rose is, you don't know what it smells like, you don't know what it looks like. How can you possibly even imagine what it looks like, smells like, or feels like in that moment to close your eyes? And that's where that, the, the, my truth started to come out is, First, I have to realize what would that even feel like or look like? You know, a lot of us say, oh, I don't have that worth. Well, if you don't know what worth is, how do you know if you have it or you don't? How do you know it's missing if you don't even know what it is? So I started on this exploration of learning what does worth mean? What does self-esteem mean? And what would it look like if I had it? What would it feel like to know my worth? What would it feel like to have self-esteem? And all of a sudden I started seeing my whole life and why I came up with not feeling that way. And because of the chatter, it's what are we using as our measurement tool? You know, who, who are we measuring ourselves to, to say that we're worth it or we're not? Who are we measuring ourselves to, to say that I do mean something in this world or I am a good person. And that's really where everything started to pivot was after that seminar, realizing that, okay, now it's up to me to figure out what are my measurement tools? What do I want it to look like? Getting absolute clarity and just knowing that when I changed what I saw in my life, everything I saw started to change in my life. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it, start, it started from that kind of that shift in perspective of being exposed to an environment where you saw kind of what was possible within within feeling you know great within yourself or, or certainly different from how you were feeling in that that environment um and yeah the the walking on fire you made me a bit i laughed then because uh i've uh, i've done it but i've never done it at a tony event unfortunately because um 
haven't managed to get to the lives yet. But yeah, that must have been some experience. And certainly, I guess, did that play a bit of a role in kind of changing your beliefs and the fact you, you might have thought, oh, this isn't possible. And then you actually had done it by the end of it. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, it's funny because now I'm actually, I, before I was a trainer for Tony, I was on the fire team. And so like, <laughs> I mean, I, at this point, I think I've done over 50 UPWs since 2007, just volunteering, attending, being a crew, a volunteer crew member, being a volunteer senior leader, now being a trainer and, you know, being, going from creating the fire, like literally sweeping the parking lots for 12 hours to get it ready for the participants to walk out to literally laying the sod to burning the wood to creating the kindle and from all of that backstory of how a fire walk is created to being someone who actually sends people across the coals right to get them in state to go across the coals and i remember in that moment of thinking of like the the moment i thought i couldn't do something and i did it anyway and I'm like, let's just do this. And so I, I remember storming across those coals. And now even in my life, when I when I face a challenge, I look at it as my firewalk. That moment of feeling like there's no way I can do this without burning my feet to changing that belief by showing myself that I can do it. And I did not burn my feet, you know? And so, and what is a belief? It's absolute certainty in something that you fathom right our beliefs come from you know our, our feelings and emotions come from a belief a thought and a lot of our beliefs come from a protection that we needed when we were little that no longer service now you know and so it was in that moment i realized that's how quick beliefs can change and so if i had a belief that i wasn't good enough that too could change but what did i need what did i need in my life to have that certainty that 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 I was good enough, that I that I can be something. I remember going to my first date with Destiny in 2008 and we we're, were doing goal setting and we we're writing down our goals. And I remember writing down like, um, I'll make 5,000 a month. And I'm like, okay, this is such BS. Like there's no way I can make 5,000 a month. I mean, at the moment I was making a thousand a month. Okay. So, and raising two kids off of that. And so I was like, uh, how am I going to make 5,000 a month? Like, and now I, like, I superseded that over the years. And yet back then I had a belief that like, oh my God, only the rich people make that much. Like, there's no way I can make that, you know? And now like, I look at my life and I'm like, what are the other things in my life or when I'm working with clients that they feel is such a stretch for them? And it really takes just knowing that it is possible. Whatever we want is possible. It's just we have to change the beliefs around it. Mm. The, yeah, the beliefs. Uh, it's and it's interesting. Like I, was, I guess as it was kind of I I uncovered as I went into my personal growth journey. Like some beliefs you uncover a little bit, and I guess as you were going more on your journey, you you kind of uncovered more and more. Um, uh, did you did you feel like you you uncovered more and more of those beliefs as you went through some of those Tony events? Um, absolutely. Mm. And I mean, I still uncover some of them, you know, like yeah, there are still things inside of me like, you know, I, I've been doing William White Cloud's work with where it's a lot about the intuition and being tapped into our super conscious versus our ego. And I remember going through his like the 12 beliefs that were, you know, we, we have these beliefs and which two are the forefront one. And I remember unworthy came up and I'm like, wait a second, I've worked on this. Like, I know I'm worth it now to realize that there was still that underlying of not feeling worth in my life. And where does it still show up? And it's, it's a beautiful thing to continue to be hungry, to continue to grow and uncover even more areas of my life where I'm on this journey still. And, you know, it's like Tony says, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying. Hmm. And for me, growth is to stay hungry and to know that like, this is not the end all be all. Like, you know, now I'm an instructor for Joseph McClendon's neuroencoding program. If somebody would have told me that six months ago, like, hey, they're going to hire you. You're going to be the instructor. I would have been like me. I, I'm going to be that. Like, it wasn't even on my trajectory to even think about, 
you know, I was going through it like all the other students, like, wow, like this is a new program and I want to be licensed and I want to teach this. And, you know, this is what I'm already doing. And how do I, you know, make it in my life to go further faster? And it, it fell into my lap. And so where else in our life do we continue to grow and unravel other areas of our life that keep us growing in our life? Yeah, and it's int- I love what you said about growth because, and it's like talking about the six human needs, like sort of Tony Robbins, like growth's one of the spiritual ones and something is, is kind of in the personal growth world and then sort of the Tony Robbins, Joseph world. I'm, it's, it's probably my, my, one of my top two needs. Uh, might be the same with you, but I found with growth, the more you grow, the more challenges will actually come up with these, these beliefs that you uncover. Um, And it's funny enough, when I was, I don't know, like a few years ago now, like my earlier 20s, I was very much kind of in that state of, actually, I felt comfortable, I wouldn't find as many limiting beliefs. But as I pushed myself through my coaching career, as I pushed myself through like writing more books, putting myself out there on podcasts, on videos, that's when you get some more challenges like sort of pop up, because you're coming more and more out of what what's safe for you. So yeah, that's certainly what what I find with um, with beliefs that more limiting beliefs can pop up, but it's about how we respond to them. But yeah, like I'm glad you said we always can uncover more, uh, but it's just how we respond to them. And I like the way you share that as well, because sometimes people can feel like they're alone with these limiting beliefs, like I am not enough. But from your clients, I, I'd imagine you've worked with and clients I've worked with, it's pretty much a trend across everyone. It's something oh, yeah. I've experienced, you've experienced, I'm not enough, I'm not lovable. So um, yeah, totally, totally relate to that. One thing you mentioned earlier was uh, just going back to what you were saying earlier about uncovering what does self-worth mean to you? What does self-esteem mean to you? And kind of, you didn't know what it felt like and you were like, okay, imagine that. Did, and this is something both Joseph and Tony teach and many, many people teach, but, and Jim Rohn on there especially, but role modeling did you when you were going out there and finding what it meant did you go out and look at particular individuals who might be strong in those areas when you were discovering more about self-esteem and self-worth yeah because i had to change my measurement tool Mm. right like so what my measurement tool was like looking at these girls maybe like you know at the bars like when i when i go to the bar and go dancing and drinking and you know hoping to find that me, you know, I was tired of being a single mom for so many years and trying to get other people to say, oh, she's, she's good looking enough or, oh, she is my person. And so I was looking at all these other women and what they were wearing and what they were looking like and how they were their mannerisms. And that was my measurement tool. And yet I look at those girls now and I was like who they are now, like that is so not me. And so I was always striving to be something I wasn't because of the measurement tools that I had created. And so when I got into the world of self-development, which is developing yourself, Hmm. I had to find new, new role models, like who are the people? And I remember one in particular, her name's Lauren Lahav and, um, you know, (laughs) she and I are very good friends now. And when I met her, she was the director of the crew in 2008, when I first, you know, volunteer crewed for a a Tony event. And I remember her strength and I remember her leadership in that room. And I was in awe about this woman. And I'm like, I, I want to know her. And I ended up being one, she calls her crew babies. Like she takes like a few of us under her wings and she helps us develop it. And I remember specifically, like in 2008, we were sitting down she's like, tell me about you. And I was telling her about myself. And she's like, you're going to do great things in this world. Like I believe in you. And I'm like, she, she believes in me, (laughs) like really like me. And, you know, I mean, at this point I had only done a UPW. It's my first time crewing. I hadn't done any other events in Tony. Like I, I'm just brand new baby into the, you know, the, the self-development world. And I'm like, wow, she believes in me. And because she said that it gave me value. Like I was now going to explore what did that mean? Like, why did she believe in me? And how do I believe in myself? And I will tell, I tell people this whole story. I, me and her laugh about it. Like she was that pivot for me that somebody believed in me when I didn't even believe in myself. And I didn't even know what that mean to believe in myself. 
and to see my strengths and to see that I even had strengths and to honor the strengths that as a woman, you know, a single woman, an Indian woman in this world, you know, being able to carve out the life that I wanted. Like that in itself was a new belief for me. And I had no evidence of it though. You know, I mean, my mom who was a single mom and she was Indian and she, she create, she put herself through law school and I saw her strength, but it was such a masculine thing. And I, and I wore this masculine mask for so long, having to have control and being in charge because that was like what I saw in my life to saying, wow, like there's a feminine energy in me. And what would that mean to tap into that? And what would it mean to have friends that are girls and not be jealous of them? And, you know, to straighten each other's crown without even knowing that it was crooked. Like, what does this all mean? And, and Lauren helped me understand that. And she created this whole labella and brought me into this labella family where it's just us females enjoying each other's females company and not having this jealousy and, and fixing each other's crown because we didn't know they were even crooked. And I'm like, holy cow. And honestly, that was a huge pivot again in my life to, to see that feminine power inside of me even existed. And it was when I cultivated that is when I met my now husband, we've been together now for 10 years and to attract that person right at the right time to, you know, love me at my worst and celebrate me at my best. I, I didn't even know that was possible until I knew I was possible. And it started with that role model. Hmm. Love it. Love it. The, the role models, because I mean, I mean, for me personally, the people, and even like a client I'm trying to work with, they might want to progress in a certain business or area. And like, you know, their speciality is not necessarily going to be my speciality is in helping them find the confidence of, in themselves and the tools and uncovering that self-doubt but if they're looking for an individual or an individual route in like their business or their area I'm always a keen believer in helping them finding that role model who's killing it as much as possible doing awesome so I've seen you know I've I've met Laura at a well not met her personally but I've come across her at a couple of events um and yeah so totally understand what you say really really uh inspiring woman um uh yeah played a, we played a fun game at wealth mastery actually i remember that one um although we gotta get her, we'll, we'll get her on your podcast and we'll let your <laughs> viewers understand what i'm talking about like from, from the real deal like you know great woman the other thing though to understand about our role models right like at that moment like i wanted to be lauren mm. but yet <laughs> as i grew i realized i didn't want to be lauren i wanted to be Venu. I just wanted to, what are the things about her that I love? And we all have things about each other that we need to, you know, let go of. Like some of her blind spots, whatever they are, like that I recognize, I'm like, okay, so that's what I don't want to be, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, just like, you know, I've mentored some people. And so there's lots of areas that they want, like I want to be like Binu. And I'm sure there's things that I do. They're like, okay, that's what part I don't want to be like Binu, you know? I mean, we, and to identify that because, you have to create your own individuality as well. You know, we don't need another Lauren. You know, we, we need you, we need me, right? We need our own individuality. But with that said is, how do we adopt what we love about that person that makes them that dynamic, that, that, that energy? And how do we cultivate it into our own selves? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And it's, I always like to make the point that it's being you, but seeing the qualities they've got because that you would like, because you you're capable of having those qualities. So, uh, you know, you can, you can enhance them. I like what Joseph says about the, the three things he considers in role modeling. And I've certainly used it in it's the physiology, the way people move their body, the way the beliefs they have. So, what they believe about themselves and what would you therefore like to take about that and what what do you need to start believing about yourself now and you can believe you can change your beliefs like you said like that you can start believing them now and it's the syntax the order they do it and that's kind of you know that can be more 
useful for like mentoring and progressing in an area as well. But yeah, I love the way Joseph explains it as well. But it sounds like you might have taken on board some of her beliefs she had about you and yourself and you took them into your into your own life. And sometimes that's what we need to ignite mm. it, because if you can't see what I see in you and. And I and I share that with you and it ignites something like, wow, like this person that I look up to sees that in me there. And I know that that person doesn't lie. Like I know, like Lauren's message is stay true to yourself. Like that is her message. What does that mean to stay true to yourself? That means for me that regardless of the chatter out there, regardless of the measurement tools that you're seeking, what is your definition of you? What does it mean to be you through your eyes and your filters? That's staying true to me. You know, if I say, you know, like, I used to smoke, I smoked, gosh, for 25 years. And yet when I would go to an event, I wouldn't smoke. And then as soon as I got on that, my taxi on the way home, I would light up a cigarette again. It's like, I didn't want them to see me and I wasn't being true to me. Like if anything, that was the area, the arena I can be in and be myself and not feel judged, but yet I was judging myself. And so I had to ask myself, why, when I go to a Tony event, do I not smoke? But as soon as I'm away from those people, I smoke. Like, what's my truth? Either I'm a smoker or I'm not. I got to make up my mind. And so it was at an event in New York that I let go of my cigarettes in the hotel room and I never looked back. And it was in 2010 and I haven't smoked since. And it was creating a new identity. And that's what it meant to be true to myself. That if that's the arena I want to be in, if that's the, the people that don't judge me and yet I'm judging myself, what do I need to let go of? And it was the cigarettes and I did. Hmm. So to me, that's being true to me. It's not being one way for you to see me and then being a different way. Like most people that know me in the business sense and the personal sense, they will tell you that I walk my talk and I'm very vulnerable you know, I coach parents, I coach kids, but sometimes I lose my shit with my own kids and I'll be open about it because that to me is where the learning is, mm -hmm. is that when you can be so real and raw that you don't have to hide to be a persona. So people like you, like, like me and know that what I'm teaching you is because I've experienced it. And sometimes I still do experience it with my own kids. That to me is staying true to yourself. It's not when people like, there's so many people out there that like, oh, be authentic, like authenticity. And yet you watch their Facebook and as soon as they get comments that call them out, they delete those comments and they only keep the good ones. And yet the whole post is about authenticity. Interesting. What's authentic about that? What's authentic about that? I mean, to me, authenticity is if I'm putting it out on Facebook, that means I'm putting it out for public judgment and you may judge it and say, wow, like, really, you did that? How about thinking about other people's feelings? And then you got other people who haven't seen that side of me. We're like, wow, like, that's amazing. Good for you. Congratulations. So I delete the ones that don't serve my my own agenda and I only keep the ones that are congratulating me. How is that authentic? And unfortunately, that's why there's that dis dissertion of, you know, looking at Facebook. Is it a Facebook life or is it their real life? Hmm. Know who your mentors are because a lot of these mentors aren't walking the talk. So if that's who you value and that's who you follow, you become who you hang out with. I know Jim Rohn said it, Tony said it, Joseph says it, all the great speakers say that, right? You know, show me the people you hang out with. I'll show you your, your life. Yeah. The quality, the quality of your, well, the quality of your life is in proportion to your quality of your peer group. Uh, one of the, the phrases goes, yeah. Always love that one. And it's just, it's reset in different ways, but that's true. 
Put a child, a 15 year old who doesn't smoke, let them hang out with a bunch of smokers. I guarantee you in three months that child has tried smoking, if not their smoker themselves. Hmm. And peer pressure looks different now. Peer pressure is like, hey, do it, do it. It's cool. Peer pressure is not asking you to do it, but we're going to continue to be us that you that you feel left out of the group. So you just start doing it. No one's asking you. Because you conform to what you hang out with. Yeah, totally. And sometimes people say you, you know, obviously that there's sometimes you might be hanging out with toxic people and that's going to impact on how you feel. But sometimes like I've got various different friendship groups I've been blessed to make in my life. And yet I I'm kind of been pretty good with not attracting too many toxic people in the last. And if I, if I see they're toxic, you know, I know straight away, but you know, you have different groups who are kind of into different things. And I know my personal growth groups and people who are really like driving and got similar missions. And I know kind of the groups who may just be like old friends, we have a laugh, we hang out, but it kind of, it does make a big difference. But throughout all of those, it is key, like you're saying, to have that identity that you love. Um, and, you know, the, you're never going to be able to please everyone. I think there's a saying also that goes that if you want to please everyone, you know, just go in a cave and hide away, basically, because there's always going to be someone who doesn't like you. So I think that's what people fear. Like you, was, I think that's what you were uh, sort of going towards anyway, because uh, like people deleting people, not liking them. But, you know, that's always that's always going to happen, unfortunately. If the people that delete me or unfollow me or whatever, they're not my people anyway. Like it's okay. You know, it's people want these big platforms because it makes them feel good. Well, you can have a platform of 10,000 people where they're just following you for no reason. Like they get no value add, or you can have 200 people that really hear you and see you and want to know more about you and what you teach. And they have the value add. Like, what would you rather have? I always say I'd have the 200 in a heartbeat, hmm. you know, but again, what's our measurement tool? What's our measurement tool to know that we're doing it right? You know, what does it mean to do it right? And I always look at what's the meaning, what's the meaning we give anything. You know, I have a lot of clients that they're looking at, you know, I need to be perfect. Great. What does perfect mean to you? Not what it means to me. What, what is perfection? How will you know you you're there? What, what, what would change about you? What would you feel? What would you be doing different? What would your life look like differently if you had, had are at that point? And I'm going to tell you, and I'm sure you get this with your clients too. The biggest challenge people have is they don't have clarity. They don't have clarity of what they really want. They know what they don't want, <laughs> but they don't know what they want. And that goes back to, you know, just to come back full circle to how we started the conversation if you don't know what self-worth is, feels like, how do you know you're missing it or you don't have it? Yeah. We have to have clarity of what we want and what that would feel like. You know, I just really wanted to wake up and not feel like, please just kill me now. Like, I wanted to know what that felt like. I wanted to know what it felt like to really want to live because I enjoy life, not because I have to because I get to, I wanted to know what it was like to live my life in a get to opportunity versus living my life because I had to. And that's when I achieved that. I can say I achieved my worth because every day I get to, and if anything taught me that it was laying in bed for 14 days with COVID, <laughs> not being able to do what I wanted to do. And it's like, wow, like, what I take advantage of each day in my life that, you know, you and I were talking about right before we got on this call is like mm. the little things we take advantage of, we just take for granted. And I'm like, it just gave me a deeper loving for myself, for what I do and for life. Yeah, I get to like those words, very powerful words and have a completely different meaning from I have to. Um, words can have such a huge impact um and yeah 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 love those love those choice of words and the way you've done particularly what you said about the focus and the way that 
shifting from what I don't want because if you look you get what you focus on <laughs> if, you're, if you're focusing on what you don't want like oh, I don't want this pain I don't want this misery anymore and this self you know misery and self-inflicted pain and things like that if you're looking at I don't want that rather than I want this meaning of self-worth and self-esteem and to discover what it is and the joys of life you know you get what you focus on so i love what you um you said about people focusing tend to focus on what they don't want rather than what they want so i think that's an important message you do. and that's what joseph kind of talks about when he talks yeah. about like the magnetism right like what's our magnet that's pulling us towards what we want and then you create the discipline out of it it's kind of like what you said about the syntax right like yeah. what's their what what what's that person's physiology what are their beliefs and values but then what's the syntax like what are they following what's their discipline in, in creating that hmm. you know are they just sitting on a couch going oh, i just want a good body i just want a good body but you know what i really want to eat these potato chips right now you know or are they that person that says you know what i love these potato chips and i'm gonna have two but i gotta get on that run because i like the way my body feels even better after i get done with that run right and so it's really focusing on what is that pull for you that pulls you into it so and that's what creates your get to all of a sudden you get to run you don't have to run hmm. love it love it so Binu, the uh the time's flown by and i've really really enjoyed our uh, conversation so much value as i knew there would be but um are there any kind of any last points that you would just like to give to the listener today so, you know, I would say this, my, my favorite thing to leave people with on podcasts is get curious and not critical. Hmm. You know, we tend to self beat ourselves up instead of self build. And we can only do that when we're critical. So if there's something about yourself that you don't like, instead of concentrating on what you don't like about yourself, get curious about what would it look like if that didn't exist in you, what would you need to feel differently so that didn't exist in you? Get curious about it instead of critical about it and start self-building instead of self-beating. Ah, oh, brilliant. Love that phrase. Get curious, not critical. Uh, always like little uh, short, sharp phrases, and that's a very powerful one. So thank you for sharing that, for sharing that one. So where can a ton of great information given today, but where can people find you if they'd like to find out more about your work and yeah, just get in touch with you. So what's great is I made it very simple. It's just be new inspires, B E E N U inspires.com. All my social media is be new inspires. And um, I also have a, um, a parent group that's out there, you know, um, helping parents just, give their kids a childhood they don't have to heal from, you know, so it's just, um, it's called redefine parenting. So we're just redefining it. And, you know, I, as much as I focus on parents being curious, not critical with their kids, it's how do we give our kids a childhood where they feel their self-worth and self-esteem. So when they're our age or as they're going through college, they're not questioning who they are and their identity right? Like they, they know they have their worth. And so if you go to my, my, uh, my webpage, venueinspires.com, there's a free ebook that, you know, teach your children that they're enough. Um, please download it. Um, there's, it's a quick read, um, but it gives you some great nuggets on, it doesn't matter what age, like I, I have six kids that from the age of nine-year-old twins to 27 year old, and I'm a grandma. And, you know, it doesn't matter how old your children are, like these uh, strategies I put in that book, will definitely support you no matter where you're at with your kids to help them realize their own worth. Brilliant. Uh, sounds like an amazing resource and opportunity for people to uh, check out. So what we'll do is we'll leave those links in the description of this episode, both on the YouTube video and the podcast episode today. So once again, thank you so much for thank being you. with us, Fina. Really great thank conversation. You. And I'll speak to you in the next episode. Remember to take control of your self-confidence.